lifted up and let there be a spirit of expectation. Let there be enthusiastic worship. Now one more time as loud as you can. Somebody put their hands together. Somebody clap because you know that Jesus Messiah is going to appear in this house. Let's talk about it this morning. He became sin that knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross.
Lift your hands up right now. Leave them up. God, we need your glory right now. Jesus. I feel the mighty presence of the Lord. I need your glory. I want your glory. Less of me, more of you is what I need. Show me your glory. Show me your power. your glory. I want your glory. Mm, less of me. Less of me and more of you is what I need. So won't you show me. Show me your glory. Uh, show me right now your power. Show me your power. Mm. Less of me. Want your glory, yeah. want your glory. Oh, Jesus. Uh -huh. Less of me and more of you is what I need. Show me your glory, Lord. Show me your glory. Show me your power. Uh -huh. Show me your power. Less of me. Less of me.
Get out of your pew and find somebody and go pray with them. Somebody needs to feel the glory of God. Just rest upon them right now. If you look around this building and you're a member of this church, I want you to find somebody. Pray with them in your pew or in your area. Don't be afraid. Don't be inhibited. Everybody needs prayer. Everybody needs somebody to feel a burden for them today. That prayer that you pray may be the thing that gets them through their storm. As we stand, somebody's around you, men to men, ladies to ladies, just put your hand on their shoulder and say, In the name of Jesus, Lord, you know what they mean. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Touch us, protect our homes, oh God. Protect the things that would try to destroy us. In the name of So let this temple I'm 
battle going on. I'm, I'm waging war against it. I made up my mind Wednesday night. I'm going to fight this battle that would try to put division in our homes, division in our young people, division in our families. I'm waging a war like I've never waged and I need you to get with pastor. A war that is trying to divide us in worship. A war that says just let it go. Who cares? I'm telling you it's the breath of life in this church. That's why when somebody says, let's lift our hands, you ought to get those hands up as high as you can and say, oh God, let me be a part of this. Let me get in one mind and in one accord. Let me have unity in the church. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I really would. I just want to take a moment. We're going to go on in the service. I would like for ladies to look around and men to look around this auditorium. I want you, if somebody's by themselves, I want you to go stand with them. Men, ladies, look around and if there's, I don't want one person by themselves. Not one. I want you to look around. Young people, look around your youth department. If there's one young person by themselves, that's why when you walked in today, we've designated this, these rows right here. Our young people are going to be all together. They're going to fight together. They're going to sit together. They're going to worship together. Our generation J is going to be over here on the front. Why? We're going to get together. Because we're going to dedicate this temple to you, Lord. We're going to dedicate this temple. We want you to use it for your purpose, Lord. We want you to dedicate this temple to you. I want you to look around. I see, I see somebody over here by themselves. I need you men to get out of your pews right now all over this house. If a husband and wife is together, that's great. I want you to look around. I don't want anybody by themselves. It ought to be the picture of the church. No man left behind, no lady left behind. I want men to lay their hands on the shoulder of the man next to them. I want ladies to take the hand of them next to them. I want you, if you would, just the ladies lift that hand up. And men, I want you to lift your voice, men, and pray for one another. If you're a husband and wife that is standing together, then take hands and lift that hand. I don't care if you've been married 40 years. Satan would like to devour, to devour you and destroy. That's why he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I want the name of the Lord to lift up a standard here today. I want the Spirit of God to rest upon your heart today. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, unify us today. Unify us. We lift our voice, oh God. We aren't perfect. There's a struggle going on in our lives. There's battles that we face as men and women. In the name of Jesus, oh God, let us be bound together. We're fighting the same devil. We're fighting the same enemy. Let our homes be strong. Let our men be courageous. Let our families be united. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, help us to get dedicated. Sold out. United together here today. In the name of Jesus. Oh, touch us, oh God. Help us to forgive one another. Help us to get over bitterness. Help us to destroy hurts. My God, let there be healing in our homes today. Healings in our hearts today. In the name of Jesus. Oh God. Oh God. Hallelujah. 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 
the cage. Yes. Oh, yes, oh, we do. Lord, we dedicate ourselves today we to you. We dedicate this temple oh, to you, Lord. Oh, we want you to use it, Lord. I'm going to use it for your service. Use it for your service. For your holy oh, purpose. together. Let's sing it as loud as we can. All over this house, lift your hands and sing it. We dedicate this temple to you, Lord. Oh, yes, we do. We dedicate this temple. We dedicate this temple. Use it for your purpose. Oh, yes. I want you to use it. Use it for your service. Holy purpose. For your holy purpose. Oh Lord, we, we dedicate this temple to you. You know, we're going to do it just a little different today. Today is a day that you're here in a little while. I'm going to have all the students, all those that are going to college, all those that are entering into preschool. Here in a little while, they're going to line up across front. They're getting ready to go back to school. We're going to anoint them. We're going to give them a prayer card that we've had done up for them. It's been prayed over. But you know what? Years ago when I was a kid in church, there were services that were very unique. And when they were family services, and that's really what I feel here today, there's a family atmosphere. And I remember my father, our bishop, he would turn around and tell Brother Beckham or Brother Mark, he would tell them, let's sing that old chorus, you're my brother, you're my sister. And he would tell everybody, men to men, ladies to ladies. He'd say, let's all get out of our pews and let's hug one another, encourage one another. Let's lift one another up. And you know what? Before we go any further in this service, I want everyone that would to stand to their feet. Platform, I want you all up here to stay and sing. You're going to do some hugging. You need to do it up here. But I want everyone to get out of their pews. And as we sing this song, I really would. Why don't you step out of your pew and just around your area, men to men, ladies to ladies, young people, let's hug one another, let's encourage one another. We are brothers and sisters. Come on, let's do that. That's it, young people. Young people, get together. Encourage one another. Yes. Let's take about five minutes.
Somebody clap their hands under the Lord. Somebody clap their hands under the Lord. Oh, God is good and is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. I'm glad I can call him up and lift him up and feel the sweet presence of the Lord. I'll tell you, what a great turnout today. I can't imagine what would happen if I got this whole church and nobody left for one Sunday to go on vacation and everybody stayed home. I don't know where we put them all. So it's a good thing we got people in and out, but I'm excited about the great God we're serving and the people of God. And let me say quickly, Brother and Sister Carter, uh, my father told me y'all had a new addition to your family, grandparents there, and we congratulate Brother and Sister Carter. God bless them. Two sweet, fine people of God, and I'm glad for them. Well, today is a special day. It's a special week because many of our students are going back to school. This week, all the parents are rejoicing, shouting, and we want our students to know who they are when they go back to school. And today, uh, here in just a little while, we're going to anoint each of them individually and uh, I asked our youth pastor to prepare a message that is not just for our students, but for all of us, because we're going back into the work week. You ought to see the people I have to work with. It's a wonder I stay in church sometimes, but all of us are going into the work week this week, and we need a great touch of God, and uh, we love Brother Charlie and Sister Christy, and I'm awful proud of them, and I want them to know we love them. I want Brother Charlie to come. Come on, young people. Come on, J. Crew. Let's put our hands together. Let's hear the word of the Lord this morning. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. I am honored with this opportunity to minister to you, and I thank Pastor for that. And if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I want to draw your attention one more time to verse 2, where it says, And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. I want to preach to some young people for the next few minutes who are going back to school this week on the subject, What will I become? What will I become? Can you put your Bibles down and lift your hands one more time as we pray God's anointing. Lord Jesus, I pray your anointing upon me, Lord Jesus. God, anoint me to preach your word, Lord Jesus. Anoint your people to receive it. Lord, especially your young people today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would bless us, Lord God. God, let us be an encouragement to our young people today. In the name of Jesus, to go back to their schools with, with you, Lord Jesus. And we praise you for it, and we love you today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Monty Roberts, who owns a ranch, a ranch in San Anchedro, California, was the son of an itinerant horse trainer. He would go from stable to stable, racetrack to racetrack, farm to farm, and ranch to ranch training horses. As a result, Monty's high school career was continually being interrupted. When he was a senior, he was asked to write a paper about what he wanted to do and what he wanted to be. That night, he wrote a seven-page paper describing his goal of someday owning his own horse ranch. He even drew a diagram of a 200-acre ranch showing a location of all the buildings, the stable, and the track. Then he drew a very detailed floor plan for a 4,000 square foot house that would sit on his 200 acre dream farm. The next day he handed it to his teacher and two days later he got it back. 
and on the front page was a large red F with a note that read, see me after class. The teacher said, this is an unrealistic dream for a young boy like you. You have no money, you come from an itinerant family, and you have no resources. Owning a horse ranch will cost a lot of money. You have no money to buy land. You will have to pay for the original breeding stock, and later you will have to pay large stud fees. There's no way that you could ever do it. So if you will rewrite this paper with a more realistic goal, I will reconsider your semester grade. Monty went home and asked his father what he should do. His father said, son, you have to make up your own mind on this. I think it's a very important decision because this makes up a large portion of your grade. Finally, after sitting with it for a week, Monty turned the same paper in, making no changes at all. Only across the top of the first page in red letters, he wrote, you can keep your F and I will keep my dream. Monty then turned to the assembled group and said, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you this story because you are sitting in my 4,000 square foot ranch house in the middle of my 200 acre horse ranch. And I still have that school paper framed over the fireplace. And two summers ago, that same teacher brought 30 students up here to my ranch to camp out for a week. Upon leaving, he looked at me and said, Monty, I stole a lot of kids dreams. They gave up too easily. Fortunately, your dream crystallized into an intense desire. You made the decision to take a dare. You totally dedicated all that to that direction. You dreamed it. You ate it. You slept it. You lived it. It consumed you, and it became the biggest thing in your life. You made it happen. I first want to say I'm so proud of our college and career age students. This fall, nearly 70% of them are going to be going to college. I'm proud of them. I want you to know that Christy and I, and I know Pastor and Sister Angie too, believe in you. And like Monty, you can do anything you want to do. Be anything you want to be if you set your mind to it. And to all of our kids, it's not so important to be the best as it is to do your best. It's not so important to be the best as it is to do your best. To all of our youth who are going to be going back to school, I know there are questions in life that you face, insecurities that all young people, not just church young people, all young people fight. Though you may not ask this question specifically, we all wonder from time to time, what will I become? It is a question we are all looking for the answer to, all the way up through adulthood. From an early age, we are all asked this question which has many different answers. From firefighter to astronaut, police officer to president. president. Our answer will change many different times throughout our life, through high school and even into college. The fact is, most college students change their majors at least one to two times before they will graduate, simply trying to answer their own question, what will I become? We are looking for the career that we feel will give our life a sense of purpose and meaning. The sad thing is, most people feel that once they find the right career for them, life will be blissful and everything will just fall into place only to find the right job doesn't bring the happiness they thought it would. The right career can't save their marriage or bring peace in their home. The fact is, the question posed here, what will I become, has more to do with my purpose in life, which comes from God, than my pursuit of the perfect job. We can't examine our own lives and expect to find the answer. We can't look at creation for answers. We must go to the creator. Psalms chapter 139 and verse 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Young people, we are the sons and the daughters of Almighty God. When you go back to school this week, you're not going alone. If you have the Holy Ghost living inside of you, you have the comforter in your life. 
It is the Holy Ghost that will help you make right choices and right decisions. It's the Holy Ghost when you're at school who will help you to pick the right friends if you'll allow it to. When peer pressure comes, it's the Holy Ghost that will help you to say no. God is watching over each and every one of you as you go back to school this week. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is no need to be insecure. There's no need for insecurities. You are a child of God. If you were best friends with LeBron James and he went to your school with you one day, you wouldn't have insecurities. But the fact is, we have Almighty God who gave LeBron his talents and abilities and who is our best friend, who, is, who does stick it closer than a brother, that is always there for us, who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, and he is there with us, the one who created us, and you are the apple of his eye. He goes with you every day, and there is no need for insecurities. For some high school students... High school is a cruel world. I hate to, say, to see young people who make life-altering decisions, that are the wrong decisions, based upon the world of high school, which is not real. After, graduate, after graduation, you will quickly find out the high school quarterback doesn't have hundreds of people to look up to him and think that he's so cool. That cheerleader doesn't have hundreds of other students to look at her and think she is so pretty. There is no more popularity, only an empty life of just another person on the planet working a job. All they have left is the few friends they may have. So young people, don't sell out to gain popularity. Don't give up true friends who accept you for who you are to gain friends who would try to change you through peer pressure. Don't sell out your morals because others at school talk a big game and tell you everybody's doing it. Statistics show everybody's not doing it. Don't sell out for popularity. Don't sell out for the things of this world. It's not worth it, young people. You'll quickly find that out after high school. Why don't we make decisions this year to stand up and stand out? To be proud that you're a Christian. To be proud to be apostolic. We've been called to come out from among them and be ye separate. We don't go all the places the world goes. We don't do all the things they do. There is a call on each and every young person in this place to become like Christ. High school is not the real world. Do not be conformed in a place like that. We all try to find the answer to the question, what will I become on our own all too often? We have free will to write our own story, but Hebrews Chapter 22 and verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Bible declares, young people, that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. We as humans, limited by our circumstances and situations, write the story of our lives with no knowledge of what comes around the bend and no power to change our circumstances. Trying to answer our own questions, what will I become? But when an author writes a book, he can change a situation from bad to good with just a swipe of the pen. He can take a character in a book and put them in a situation with no way out and write them out of that situation. Why? Because he is the author. It's the same way in our lives. When you're the author of your own life, we mess things up. We don't know what we shall be. But when we allow Jesus to be the author and the finisher of our faith, when we say, God, here, you take the pen, you write my story, because when I do it, I just mess it up. God, I want what you want for me. God, I'm sick of doing it on my own because I always mess it up. He knows the beginning from the end, and he has it in control. No longer are we, when we give him the pen, no longer are we as much concerned about what will my career be. But when Jesus holds the pen, the focus is more on am I, what am I called to be? What should my ministry be? What can I do for the kingdom of God? 
It's not should I be a fireman. It's I should be a worshiper who starts a fire in my youth group. It's not should I be an astronaut. It's I should be a witness to help other people make it to heaven. It's not should I be a police officer. It's should I be a Sunday school teacher to protect our students by teaching his word. It's not should I be president. It's should I be a pastor or does God want me to be a preacher? God, what do you want for my life? God, you take the pen and you tell me what I shall be. Should I join the cleaning team? Should I join the praise team? Should I be a greeter? Should I be an usher? Should I work in the sound department? Should I work in the video department? Should I work in children's ministry? Should I give Bible studies? Yes, yes. The answer is always yes. God is here. God, you take the pen. God, it's not clear to me what I'm going to be but I want to be what you want me to be. 10 to 12 years ago, I never knew I'd be the youth pastor at CLC. This is my dream job. I'm not looking for something further. I'm not thinking about other things in my life. This is what I wanted to be. This is what I'm doing, and I am so glad to be here. Never thought I would be here, but God wrote my story. 10 to 12 years ago, Pat never knew he'd be the worship leader at CLC. 10 to 12 years ago, Brother Brandon never knew he would be so heavily involved in music and over our young marrieds and over our high schoolers. 20 years ago, pastor didn't know what he would be our pastor, but they allowed God to write the story of their life. And young people, if you'll allow God to write your story, it's no telling what is sitting in our youth group today. Amen. The next, the next pastor of CLC, the next youth pastor, the next Sunday school teacher, the next worship leader, the next this, the next that. I can't wait to see one, two, ten years down the road. What amazing thing God is going to do in our young people's life. There's a lot of them and I'm so proud of them. They've given God the pen. Don't ever take it back, young people. Don't ever take it back and try to write your own story. You'll mess it up. Allow him to take the pen and the control of our lives. Please don't misunderstand me. College and careers are great. And I want all of our young people to be successful in their life. But I want us to know that our focus must be on the things of God. Our focus must be on ministry. Our focus must be on things that would, that would build the kingdom of God up more so than the things of this life. For what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world but lose his own soul? We find in the story of Joseph, a young boy who was a dreamer. He dreamed that one day his brothers would bow down to him. This didn't make him too popular with them. They saw him one day and conspired to kill him. They decided to throw him into a pit until they figured out how they would do it. Then they saw a slave merchants coming by and decided to sell Joseph into slavery. They dipped his coat of many colors in blood and told their father Joseph had been killed by a wild animal while Joseph was taken into slavery in the land of Egypt. In Potiphar's house, he excelled until Potiphar's wife decided she wanted to have Joseph for herself. Not willing to do this, Joseph ran away, leaving his coat behind. And Potiphar's wife lied on Joseph, which got him thrown into prison. I'm sure in slavery and in prison, Joseph thought, why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this situation? while never turning his back on God, who was the author of his life, who one day sent the butler and the baker with their dreams to Joseph to interpret them. Joseph interpreted the dreams and the baker was put to death while the butler was restored to his position. Joseph was forgotten for another two years until Pharaoh had a dream that no one could interpret. It was then that the butler remembered that Joseph had interpreted the dream and told Pharaoh about Joseph. Joseph was brought to Pharaoh and he interpreted his dream. And there would be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. With the interpretation of the dream, Joseph made a second, was made second in command. Second only to Pharaoh. He was given great wealth and great power. Joseph stored up in the seven years of plenty for the seven years of famine. And the world of their time was in, when the world of their time was in crisis, many were saved because Joseph, inclu- 
because of Joseph, including his own family and brothers. God wrote Joseph into slavery and into prison only to write him out to be the second most powerful man in the world next to Pharaoh. God was able to save his people because Joseph trusted God to be the author of his life. Joseph could have easily gotten bitter at God and given up, but he didn't. If you allow God to be the author of, the, of your life, it's not to say that you're never going to encounter problems. It's not, going to, it's not to say you're never going to go through anything. But if you'll do that, he will always write you out, young people, of your situation if you allow him to hold the pen. 1 John 3 and 2 again says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. Young people, if you want to know what you should be, it's our goal to be like Christ. That's what we shall be. Be like Jesus. We have to let him be the author of our lives. And we do that by having a relationship with him through prayer, worship, reading the, his word, and being submissive to him. Listening for his voice when he tells us what, to do, what he wants us to do in his kingdom. In 1963, Madeline Murray O'Hare won a lawsuit against the Baltimore school system, which voted in her favor 8 to 1 to ban school prayer and labeled it unconstitutional. Though not all prayer was immediately banned from schools at that time, through the process of time, almost all school prayer is banned today. Since that time, we have seen in our teens, morals have declined. Drug use has risen. Teen pregnancy has risen. Right down the line, the problems have increased. But I tell you today, that is not our problem, that prayer was taken out of schools. I want to speak to our parents for a moment. I'm not going to blame prayer being taken out of schools being the decline of America. I'm more concerned that there is no prayer at home. We shouldn't be depending on our schools to teach our kids morals and spiritual things. There's a great proverb that says it doesn't matter what you teach them, they will grow up just like you. You can tell your kids to go to youth prayer on Sunday mornings before service and tell your kids to go to youth prayer on Wednesday nights, but if they don't see you going into the prayer rooms, they're going to grow up to be just like you. If your, if your kids don't see you praying in the home, they're not going to pray in the home. If your kids don't see you reading your Bible, they're not going to read their Bible. If they don't see you worshiping in the house of God, they're not going to be worshipers. To all of our parents, I wonder if we could make a commitment today and just by maybe lifting up your hand to have prayer in the morning before your kids leave for, leave for school. I'm not talking about 20, 30 minutes, you know, getting up an hour early to, just to simply have prayer. I'm talking just a two-minute prayer, getting together, consistency before they walk out the door each morning saying, God, put a hedge around my kids. God, watch over my kids while they're at school and I can't be there. Help them to choose the right friends. Help them to make the right decisions. I wonder if I can see some hands of parents who will do that. You're sending your kids back to school. Amen. We're going we're gonna to have prayer with our kids each morning before they go off. Another thing I want to say to our parents is know their friends. I often tell our kids, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. If you hang out with kids who do drugs, your kids are going to do drugs. If you hang out with kids who, who drink and smoke, your kids are going to drink and smoke. And, but if they hang out with worshipers if they hang out with people who enter the prayer rooms, if they hang out with the right kinds of people, that's what they need to do. They're going to be like that. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Parents, know who your kids are hanging with. Know who they're hanging out with. Young people, your, your best friends should be right here in the house of God. You shouldn't have your best friends at school. Your best friends should be right here at CLC. Parents, your kids have plenty of friends. They don't need another friend in you. 
I've seen it time and time again, parents who just wanted to be buddies with their children and just wanted to be their friend and they wouldn't correct them, wouldn't do anything and those young people are not in church today. What your children need is a parent of God who will stand up and stick their bony little finger in their face and said, you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna hang out with them. You're not going there. You're not wearing that. You're not doing this. They need a parent in their life. And it may not be right then. Right now, right then, it may seem like they hate your guts. But I promise you, five, ten years down the road, they'll come back to you and say, thank you for being a parent in my life. Children learn what they live. If a child lives with criticism, they'll learn to condemn. If a child lives in hostility, they'll learn to fight. If a child lives in ridicule, they'll learn to be shy. If a child lives in shame, they'll learn to feel guilty. But if a child lives in tolerance, they'll learn to be patient. If a child lives in encouragement, they'll learn to be confident. If a child lives in praise, they'll learn to appreciate. If a child lives in fairness, they'll learn to live in justice. If a child lives in security, they'll learn to have faith. If a child lives in approval, they'll learn to like themselves. If a child lives in acceptance, they'll learn to have friendship as we stand all across the building. Joshua 24 and verse 15 says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers that your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There need to be some parents of God today that say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. There needs to be some godly young people that go into your school and say, I don't care what other people may do. I'm not going to bow down to temptation. I'm not going to bow down to peer pressure. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. I want to do something right now. If all of our J. Crew youth, if you would come up here, I want you to come up here on this side, right here. If you're going back to school, if you're going to college this fall, if you're going back to school, uh, all of our J. Crew youth over here. And to all of our J Zone and, and preschoolers, from preschool to kindergarten, if you would come right over here, preschool, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, if you would just come right over here, we want you all to come up and spread out. We're going to pray for you here in just a moment. Young people, I want to tell you today, don't let anybody steal your dream, but allow your dreams to be in line with the things of God. Joseph went from a brother to a slave, to a prisoner, to the second most powerful man in all the world because he allowed God to be the author and the finisher of his faith. I wonder if there's some young people who today you would say, I'm going to allow God to be the author and finisher of my faith. I'm going to give him the pen and I'm never going to take it back because I want what he wants for me. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But I'll tell you what, if you give your pen to him and allow him to write the story of your life, young people, amen, everything is going to be all right. I'm going to ask Pastor to come right now. Thank you, Brother Charlie. What a great, great message. Let's put our hands together for that. I would like for all the parents to make their way in, all the adults to make their way in behind our students here today. Uh, I want all of our adults, if you would, let's squeeze in. Let's have unity here today. The ministry is anointing all of our students from preschool to those that are going to college. And this year I was, I think it was great. I was reading in the connection paper of the different ones. I know that Annalie just left for IBC and Spencer is leaving for Texas Bible School. I know that uh, Carissa and Christy and... Uh, there's Heidi, and let me see, help me, Brother Charlie. Charlie, we got Sydney going to college. We've we got Matt going to college. John Choice getting ready to go to Mount Vernon. This is tremendous. Who? Candy Sliger off to college. Anyone? I don't want to leave. Any, I want to. I want to make sure we acknowledge that. This is tremendous. Alyssa Hayes is, and Kaylee Baker, tremendous. Tremendous, and really, I want to encourage all of our of our students to go to college. I really think you should. I parents, let's promote it with all the grants that they can get. Uh, 
This is tremendous.